we haven't met yet, my name is David. I'm excited to spend a few minutes with you this morning. I wanna say thank you for your continued faithfulness. Thank you for your generosity. If you have your Bible today, I'm gonna ask that you turn to Colossians chapter one. Colossians chapter one, we're continuing in a series today that we've titled, Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? And what we're doing is we're working through Colossians chapter one, and we're looking at key verses that answer this question for us. And just to give you a little review of what we've talked about the past couple of weeks, we've talked about grace. Grace is God giving us what we don't deserve, new life in Jesus and all that we need to live this new life. Anybody thankful for grace this morning? And then we talked about peace and we learned that because of the death and resurrection of Jesus, we have peace with God because our sinful nature had made us enemies of God. So his death and resurrection brought about peace with God and he offers us that new life. And because we have that peace with God, now we can also have access to the peace of God so that as we face life, as we face storms, difficulties, and trials, we can access the peace of God that the Bible says guards our heart and our mind in Christ Jesus. And then I don't know about you, but I'm so grateful for the word that pastor brought us last week on faith. My heart was stirred as I listened to pastor speaking about faith and how important faith is and that Jesus is the originator and the finisher of our faith, meaning that he starts us on this faith journey and that he sees us through this faith journey. Come on, somebody, are you thankful for Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith? And today, as you have your Bible open, we are picking up at verse four, and today we're gonna talk about love. We're gonna talk about love. Colossians chapter one, verse four says this, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love, turn to your neighbor, say love, for all of God's people, which come from your confident hope of what God has reserved for you in heaven. You have had this expectation ever since you first heard the truth of the good news. This same good news that came to you is going out all over the world. It is bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives just as it changed your lives from the day you first heard and understood the truth about God's wonderful grace. You learned about the good news from Epaphras, our beloved coworker, He is Christ's faithful servant and he is helping us on your behalf. He told us about the love for others that the Holy Spirit has given you. So we're continuing in Colossians chapter one and we see here that Paul in these verses is telling the Colossians, man, I'm so excited about what God is doing in your life. I'm so excited that you have heard the gospel, you've received the gospel and as a result in your life, there's faith in Christ Jesus and then there's love for God's people. And he says, the same thing that's happening to you is happening to people all around. They're hearing the gospel, they're receiving the gospel, and their lives are being changed. And then he mentions once again towards the end, the word that we're focusing on today. And he says, Epaphras has told me about the love for others that the Holy Spirit has given you. In these few verses that we've read today, Paul is highlighting, I believe, the the direct connection, the direct correlation between encountering Jesus and life change. Meaning that when we encounter, when we hear the gospel of Jesus and receive it and come into relationship with Jesus, we can't help but want to live differently. Because once we were dead and now we're alive, And and Paul even takes it a step further. If we claim to be Christians, if we claim to be followers of Jesus, then there's signs of that, that faith inside of us. There's signs that Jesus is working in us. There's fruit that Jesus is working in us. And one of those is that we love other people. When we truly understand the love of God, we can't help but want to love other people. I think of verses like, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that's tremendous love. I think of verses like, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's tremendous love. And and when we understand that and we collide with that love, realizing that I was a sinner, deserving death, eternal separation from God in hell, and Jesus stepped in and and died the death I should have died and lived the life I should have lived for me, and he resurrected and now offers me new life, that's incredible love. And when I encounter that love, I wanna love others like God, like Jesus has loved me. In fact, in 1 John 4, 7 through 8, you have it in front of you. John talks about the fact that those that are now born again in God, those that are born of God, were in relationship with Jesus. We love because love is of God. And he takes it a step further. He says, God is love. 
So God doesn't just display love. God is the very essence, the very embodiment of love. And as we collide with his love, as we encounter his love, we can't help but want to love like him. And this love, of course, is a love that we show to people that are believers and people that are not believers. Can I get a good amen today? Whether people know Jesus or they don't know Jesus yet, we want to reflect that love. And as we think about love, I want to make sure that we're clear on a good definition of what love is, as we're defining what it is, because I feel like the world tries to give us a definition. But true love is more than just a feeling. Love is a choice. It's a decision that we make that I'm going to show up and I'm going to display all of the things that 1 Corinthians 13 tells me love is. I mean, know that if you've ever, if you've never read that chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, I encourage you to go and read it. It says things like this about love, that love is patient and love is kind, that love is not rude. Love doesn't keep a record of wrong. Love doesn't give up and love endures through every circumstance. If you ever want to know what true love looks like, it's not just when I feel like it. And it's not about just not feeling it so I just don't show it. It's making a decision to show up and display every one of these things. And for the next few minutes today, I want us to focus on what I believe or one of the things I believe Paul is talking about here in this chapter regarding love. And that's love for God's people. That's love for other Christians and for our particular setting today. That's love for your new life family. The people that you're sitting with here today and the people that will be in, circum, uh, in second service and the people that are watching online. I want to talk today about loving God's people, loving one another. Jesus, the scriptures lead us to believe that there's something really important and really powerful about us loving each other. When Jesus was talking to his disciples in John chapter 13, verses 34 to 35, he said this, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Jesus, in this moment, he's talking with disciples, followers of his, and he says something that isn't necessarily new because it actually already existed from the Old Testament. The command was always there to love our neighbor, to love people around us. But that word that he says new is actually meaning that he's, he's presenting it in a fresh way. He's restating the importance, the value of loving, and he takes it a step further, love each other. As my followers, I want you to love each other other. And, and it's important we keep that in mind. He's talking to, we could say Christians here, followers of Jesus. And instead of the new command, he could have said to them, love me, love God. And how many of you know we need to love Jesus? We have to love God. We're walking in relationship with him. But here in this moment, he chooses to highlight the importance of loving one another. And he doesn't leave any space, I love this, that he doesn't leave any space for them to speculate or try to guess what that love is supposed to look like. He doesn't let them look through love, through the lenses of love in the way that they've always loved. He gives them a definition of what this love is supposed to look like, how they're supposed to love each other as believers. And he says, love each other like I have loved you. No room for speculation because how many know today the world tries to define what love is and a lot of times it's based on whether we feel like it or we don't feel like it. If you love me, then I'll love you. A lot of times it's, it's about me first and then you seconds. A lot of times it's whatever Hollywood or social media paints for us and Jesus doesn't want there to be any confusion about how we're supposed to love each other. He says, love each other like I have loved you. You And if you're wondering again what that looks like, go to 1 Corinthians 13. Read about the life of Jesus. The love of Jesus, the way that he has loved us, the way that he loved the disciples is self-sacrificing. It's a supreme kind of love. It is a love that's, that's you before me. It's a self-sacrificing, died to myself kind of love. And he's, he's intentional. Jesus is brilliant. God is brilliant in all that he says and does. He says, do this, because as you love each other, this is going to prove to everyone else that you're mine. The way you love one another will confirm or deny that I am yours and you are mine. This is an impactful and powerful statement. 
The church of Jesus Christ, here New Life Assembly, the capital C church, we're meant to have a tremendous impact of this church on the world. How many know that Jesus said, I'm building my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it? We're meant to be light. We're meant to be salt here on the earth. We're meant to have a tremendous impact. But it seems that Jesus in this moment is highlighting the fact that that great impact first begins by us loving one another. And don't hear what I'm not saying today. The church is meant to evangelize. The church is meant to disciple. The church is meant to get mobilized to reach our community and around the world. You're meant to get into your gifting, into your talents that God's given you, and you're meant to shine Right, so don't hear what I'm not saying today, but he's singing, and again, that's our mission. If you don't know the mission of the church, it's to attract people to Jesus, to develop them to spiritual maturity, and then to empower them to love God and serve others. But Jesus here is seeming to show us that the impact that we're gonna have on this world in part is also how we love each other. As fellow believers, as fellow followers in Christ, as fellow church attenders, there's an impact that we have by simply loving each other. We can choose to love one another and the world will see that we are followers of Jesus. And Jesus, again, in his brilliance, knew that as we focus, I love this, as we focus on loving one another, we become more like him. In fact, Paul prayed it this way. I wanna put it into more simple language for you. As Paul was praying for another church, the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 12 to 13, here's what Paul said. He said, and may the Lord make your love for one another and for all people grow and overflow just as our love for you overflows. So he's praying, let there be a love in you that's bubbling over, that's overflowing in you, not just for me, but for each other. And then may he as a result, so here's the result, your hearts are strong, blameless, and holy as you stand before God our Father. Something happens inside of us when we choose to love each other like Jesus, as we focus on loving each other like Jesus, we become more like Jesus. He's changing you as you're focused on loving your neighbor. He's changing you as you're focused on loving other believers. So what's the question that we need to ask then? We need to ask, how do I love better then? If it's going to change, if it's gonna reflect to the world that I follow Jesus, if it's gonna help me grow in my relationship, the more I love fellow believers, how do I love better this year? Not how do I love better in 2025 and make it my New Year's resolution then? How do I start today loving better? And I want you to hear me in for the next few moments because I'm gonna give you four quick things, but I want you to lean in in this moment because it could be easy to hear this type of message and think to yourself, have you ever done this before? Ooh, this message is for somebody else. <laughs> I gotta get on my phone and send this to at least 10 people that I'm thinking of right now. And that's great, do that later. This is your moment to lean in and say, okay, God, what do you wanna say to me about loving the people around me? What do you wanna to speak to me? Because I wanna give you four decisions that you can make, that we can make so that we can love each other better. And this is a process. These are steps that we take for the rest of our faith in Christianity. So if you're taking notes down today, let's jot down four quick things. And the first one is the word commit. Say commit. We have to commit. And when I'm talking about committing, I want to, you to first think of, besides thinking about a church family, besides thinking about becoming a church member, you first, if you haven't yet, need to commit to the Lord Jesus Christ. Before you become part of a church family, you think a lot of times we think about, let me become a church family, become a member. You need to become part of God's family. If you're here today and you've never made a decision to trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, don't wait a minute longer. If you're here today and you're not sure where you would go if you died today, either heaven or hell, make the decision today to commit your life to Jesus. Don't wait a minute longer. Tomorrow's not guaranteed. God has a promise through Jesus to give you new life, meaning your sins are forgiven. You're given a new slate, and he not only gives you new life and not, and not only gives you the promise of eternity, he walks through this life with you. Life isn't perfect, but it's better with Jesus. Life isn't always great, but it's better with Jesus. If you've not committed your life to him before you think about the new life family, think about God's family and make a decision to commit to him today. And then I wanna encourage you, the step after that, if you haven't done it yet, be water baptized. Be water baptized. 
This is a command that Jesus gave. And, and if, it's, if we're thinking about biblical baptism, it's after we make the decision to follow and trust in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. If you've not been biblically baptized, can I encourage you to do that today? And by saying to be biblically baptized, I'm not diminishing any experiences you had as a child. Because some people are thinking in this moment, well, I was, I was christened or I was dedicated and those things can be special. But how many of you know those are decisions your parents made for you? You did not make that decision to do that. Jesus commands, he says, after, after we give our hearts to him to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, what are you doing? You're getting in front of your fellow believers and you're declaring with water baptism. Remember, we're identifying with his death as we go down and identifying with his life as we come up. And you're declaring to fellow believers, I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. If you've not been baptized, I want to encourage you to take that step. April 21st is when we have baptisms. Get signed up today under our, in our app, our website, under events, the next baptism we have. And I know what some people are thinking because you've told me it before. And you're feeling like, I got to wait till I'm at a certain level of holiness or a certain record of doing a number of goods before I get baptized. That's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. If that were the case, we'd be waiting a really long time before we could do anything. But Jesus has allowed us to come before him. Don't wait any longer. This is a command he gave. Follow him in this commandment and keep taking your steps. So first, we're gonna to commit to the family of God. We're gonna get baptized in water. But then the next thing I wanna encourage you to do, and it's super important, commit to a local church. And here's where we're talking about our New Life family. I happen to know of a really great church here in Lehigh. And I'd love for you to join our New Life family if you haven't yet. And think about this, as we join the New Life family, how many know that there's benefits that come with being part of a family, but there's also responsibilities? And if we're gonna commit, I'm gonna commit to receive the benefits, but I'm also gonna commit to the responsibilities today. So as you commit to a church, and if it's not this church, you need to be plugged into a church, a local church. Scripture stresses the importance of it. But if I'm gonna be committed, I'm gonna be committed in the responsibilities as well, meaning I'm gonna be faithful to return my tithe. The tithe belongs to the Lord. And if you are enjoying the ministries of this house, can I stress the importance in our commitment to the local church to be faithful in our tithe? God will honor you as you give the tithe and then we as a church get to keep reaching people. Isn't this amazing that people are encountering Jesus? Marriages are being healed. Students are being reached. Kids are being reached. Our community is being reached. That's because of your faithfulness to the tithe and of course to kingdom builders as we reach our community and around the world. So we accept the responsibilities, but then also I want to encourage you to faithfully attend. And there's some of you today, I'm speaking directly to you that you need to be more faithful in your attendance to church. A survey was, pulled out by, was put out, and, and one of the questions that was asked was, how often do you attend church? It was about church attendance. 20% said they attend every week. 10% said almost every week. 11% said about once a month. 26% said they seldom attend church. And 31% said they never attend church. 20% attend every week. So if we had 10 people, that'd be two out of the 10 that attend faithfully every week. And this is, again, one of the moments I want you to lean in because your church attendance does matter. One of the greatest gifts that my parents have ever given me is that we rarely ever, ever, and I mean ever, miss church. I can never remember a moment where my parents looked at me and said, hey, you feel like going today? I'm Hispanic Pentecostal. That never happened once. Never. They never looked outside and said, it, it's raining today. They never looked inside and said, it's too sunny today. It's too hot today. Even if I was sick, they got anointing oil at church. We'll pray over you. Get in the car. We're going. Some of you know what I'm talking about. But it's one of the greatest gifts my parents ever gave me. They modeled for me the importance of being in church. Why do you need to be in church? You need to be in church because you need to be around the family of believers that Jesus said you're supposed to love. It's hard to love people when you're not with them. You need to be here with us. Why do you need to be in church? Because you need to pass your faith on to the next generation. 
And not just church every once in a while, you need to faithfully be in church. If we aren't placing importance on being in church, but we're expecting our kids and our grandkids and young people to be in church, we're fooling ourselves. There's a phrase I really love. It says, more is caught than taught. You could tell young people to be in church. It's super important till you're blue in the face. But if you yourself are not here, it means nothing to them. Because what you're saying is, it doesn't really matter what I'm telling you because I'm not there either. We have to pass our faith on to the next generation. And it starts by us saying, we are going to church. Rain or shine. Sick or, well, you can pray about the sickness. Pray for them at home. That's okay. Don't spread it to people, right? But whatever happens, I'm going to be faithful in going to church because it's important that I be there. You want to love like Jesus? Get better in church attendance. Be committed and start by being here. In 1 Corinthians, Paul is talking, chapter 12, he talks about the church and he compares it to a body. And in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 50, 25 to 27, he's telling us the effects of valuing each other as church members. When we show importance, like I value you, and the way I value you is by showing up to be around you. I'm realizing that the church needs me and I need the church. Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 25 to 27, there's a couple of effects. There's harmony amongst believers when we value each other. There's harmony amongst believers when we value and love each other well. And he says what happens as we value each other is that we really do care for each other. So if you suffer, I suffer. And if I suffer, you suffer. Because you're choosing to do that. And, and if something really good happens to you, Paul says, then we celebrate it and we honor it because we're, we've made a decision to be together because we value each other. We love the church of Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ loves his church. I value you and you value me because Jesus values you and you, and you need to value me because Jesus values me. And something happens as we do that. Commit by showing up. Commit to being here. And I want to look right at the cameras when I say this for everyone that's watching from home right now. If you're there because you need to be, because you're enduring a sickness, you just had surgery, you're recovering from something, we totally understand that. But if you're there out of convenience, can I encourage you? Get back in the room. We need you here. We love you. We miss you. And we'd love to see you here. So we are going to commit. And then we're going to connect. Everyone say connect. So the starting place is us committing. I'm committing to showing up. But have you know, that's a starting place. When we commit to connect, what we're doing is that we are taking a different step and now we're not just showing up, I'm connecting with the people around me. Do you know those moments when us as pastor tell you to turn to your neighbor and say something like kind of cringy and funny, like God's here today or you know, he's in the room, whatever it is that we tell you. And how many know that in that moment, sometimes it's so hard, especially if that person is a stranger or when we're done with worship and we're like, hey, turn to somebody and greet them. For some of you, especially if you're introverted, that's so tough for you because it's like, oh my goodness, I just want to sit here and be quiet. Can I encourage you when we tell you to do that kind of stuff, take advantage of that moment and talk to your neighbor. Hey, turn to your neighbor and greet them today. Hey, my name is David. How, how are you doing today? So good to see you today. If you turn to your neighbor and tell them that little comment, what are you doing? We're starting, to, we're trying to give you little, a few seconds of conversation in that moment. But then I want you to take it another step. Here's a challenge for you. Maybe after service, what if we didn't try to rush out of this building as if there was a fire in it? Right, I'm telling you, if the Guinness World, Work, World Record book was here and they looked at how quick we get out of this church sometimes, we would set a record. Some of you are, it seems like some of you are running. And I understand some of that, right? Because in a big church environment, sometimes it can be intimidating to say, some of you have to get out of here. I'm not making light of that. But what I'm saying is, what if in, instead of rushing out of here, we took a moment to follow up with that person that we greeted after we sat down from worship? hey, have you been doing all right? Or what if we took a moment to go out to the Life Center after first service today and we bought a cup of coffee and chatted with a few people or just went out there and had some conversation? What would it look like if we started to actually get to know the people that we're sitting by every single week? It's powerful. I wanna encourage you as well that we would be a church environment, that we not only wait for people to talk to us, but that you would keep an eye out for people you've never seen and for people who are new to our church and have a conversation with them. I wanna give you a really easy thing to say. Hey, I don't know that I've ever met you before. My name's David, what's your name? How many know that that's simple? Here's a follow-up question. How long have you been coming to New Life? 
two minute conversation. I'm not telling you to have a 30 minute conversation. I'm not telling you to exchange each other's social security numbers, get addresses, go to coffee. I'm not telling you to get into any of that, right? But I am saying start somewhere having a conversation with the people around you. How are we ever gonna get to know each other if we don't put an effort into doing it? We can't just wait for everybody to come to talk to us. Can I encourage you? Scan the crowd on a Sunday morning. See if you can get here a few minutes earlier and find somebody to talk to. You never know who's lying in this crowd waiting to become a really good friend of yours, needing your encouragement and wanting to encourage you. You want to connect to people. And one of my biggest suggestions for you is to join a group. Here at New Life, what we do is we offer group seasons. They last for about 10 weeks long. And in the summer, we have one that's about six to eight weeks. And group seasons is an opportunity for you, you to jump into a group. And there's all sorts of groups. There's, there's groups for Bible studies. There's, there's walking groups. There's restaurant groups. And we have about three to four weeks left of this current group season. I want to encourage you to go to our app or to our website, check out what groups we have left, and jump into a group because they're happening all throughout the week. Even if there's three to four weeks left, that's three to four weeks for you to meet somebody and talk to them and start to build a relationship. Some of you desperately need this because life change happens in the context of relationships. That's why we believe in the power of groups. And you're getting closer to other people that are also on a faith journey. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure that if I talk to some of you today, you would admit, I need to get around people that are more like-minded and away from people that are perhaps not influencing your life in the best way. Groups is a perfect environment for you to do that. The Hebrew of writers actually says it this way. Hebrews 10, verses 23 to 25. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. If we're gonna make it, if we're gonna live this life for Jesus, and Jesus designed it this way, we need each other. If I'm gonna continue in my faith, we need each other. The world may look dark, but if we're gonna keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, we can't afford to not get together. We can't afford to not encourage each other. We can't afford to not check in on each other. The bonds that are formed in a group are so special because how many know, yes, when you have something rough show up in life, how many, it's nice to, it's nice to have your pastor show up and, pray for you and spend time with you. That's beautiful, but what is it like when your group members show up? I can remember two instances where this was so special and it's always stuck out in my mind. There was one group where one of the individuals lost a loved one and that night, some of his group members were there at the house loving on that individual and praying with that individual <clears throat> and they even set up a meal train for that individual. That's what it's all about. Yes, the pastor showed up. Yes, the pastor prayed for that individual. And the ones that continued to walk with that person were the group members. But it's not only just sad moments. There was one instance where there was a person plugged into a group and they were getting baptized and they told their group about it. And that Sunday morning when they got baptized, the whole group sat together in one section. And when it was that person's turn, they cheered that person on. It was special because they made a decision I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do life with you. You're on a faith journey. I'm on a faith journey too. And I'm going to do this life with you. I'm going to grow in my faith with you. I'm going to be there with you. To be in a group is to make a decision to take up more intentional love and care for one another. It is literally the opposite of what Cain said to God when God was asking Cain, where's your brother Abel? Cain's response was, am I my brother's keeper? For us to be in a group caring and loving for each other, it's the opposite of that. I make a decision to care for the people around me. I make a decision to check on someone that I haven't seen in a while. I make a decision to check up on someone I know is dealing with something. I make a decision to celebrate with people when they have something really good happen to them. I decide that yes, I'm gonna be my brother or my sister's keeper in Christ. I make a decision to connect. Maybe for you, it's time for you to lead a group. Maybe you're here and you're part of a young family and you'd love to see something more for young families. Can I encourage you? Be, one, be the one to be courageous and step up and do that. And some of us are so nervous to do that because we think right off the bat, it has to be a Bible study. Can I encourage you today? Something for like a young family, you could do a group that meets once a month at the park, all your kids are together and you're all just getting to know each other. Maybe you're here today and you're a guy, you want to get to know other men at the church so that you can be encouraging your faith. Can I encourage you? Maybe you could start a fishing group 
or a grilling group and all the guys said amen, right? Like we got our grill, we're cooking our food, we're having conversation. Maybe you're here and you like pickleball. We need a pickleball group. Maybe you can start a pickleball group. Wow, that really got a lot of cheers, the pickleball thing. People really do like that. (laughs) Groups can be all shapes and sizes. The point is that we're doing life with each other. Because it's not just as simple as we're playing pickleball or we're eating food. How many know that in those moments, conversation starts to happen? And now I'm learning more about you. And you're learning more about me. And then suddenly I'm praying for you. And you're praying for me. We're meant to do life with one another. And even when the group season ends, you can still get together. Some people have said that before. I don't know what to do at that period in between. Can I encourage you? Have people over your house. Meet at a restaurant. Have a game night watch a movie together, because the point of groups is not that relationship would stop when the group season is over. It can continue. Send a text message, send a voice text, have a phone call with each other. Keep the love growing. So we're coming to a close here in just a second, but we're gonna get committed, we're gonna get connected, and then I wanna encourage you to contribute. Ephesians chapter four, verses 11 through 13 Paul's writing yet again another church, and he says, now these are the gifts Christ gave the church. The apostles, prophets, and evangelists, their responsibility is to equip the people of God to do his work, to build up the church, and this will continue till we come in unity. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. To me, I always love this particular portion of scripture because isn't it amazing? The fact is that there's work to be done by new life, and that's exciting. And a lot of times that we think to ourselves, that work is meant to be done by just the pastors. It's their job to do that. And yes, we roll up our sleeves and we're getting in the work. But Paul here is pointing out, it's not just the pastor's job to do all the work. We're actually supposed to equip you, the people, to do the work. That is our, one of our greatest responsibilities. Yes, it is our joy to teach the word of God and preach the word of God, and we will do that. But we also have a responsibility to be here in the crowd with you and to look at you and say, inside of you, like gifts, talents, and abilities that God placed there for you to be a blessing, yes, outside the church, but for you to also be a blessing to the church. That's one of my greatest joys because some of you don't realize that God has placed tremendous potential and anointing on your life. And all you need is somebody to point it out and say, God's hand is on your life and he wants to use you. That is our joy. And Paul is actually pointing out that is our responsibility. And notice what happens as you start to discover there's gifts and talents in me and you get plugged in and you're serving. What does Paul say? You're helping to build up the body of Christ which is leading to unity, and then it actually leads to your maturity and your relationship with God, and it helps you grow in your relationship. And watch verse 16. As each part does its own special work, so you're operating, you're serving in your area, I'm serving in my area, it helps the other parts grow. You're serving in your area, I'm serving in my area, and by doing that, we're growing because we're helping each other so that the whole body is healthy, growing and full of love. Something happens when you make a decision to get plugged in and serve. Have you attended Growth Track yet? Growth Track is a two-step class that happens every month, the first and second Sunday of the month. The first week we learn about the church, the second week we learn about our gifts and our talents that God has placed in our life. First Peter 4.10, he just talks about walking in your gift. You have the gift of speaking, operate in the gift of speaking. You have the gift of helping, man, operate in that gift. But as you're doing that, he says, everything you do as you serve in that, it brings glory and honor to Jesus. You're pointing people to Christ as you serve in your ability. We have so many places here. We need wonderful people like you so that we can continue to reach all the wonderful people that are coming to the church. We need wonderful people in our kids' ministry. We need wonderful people in our nursery. We need wonderful people operating the cameras. We need wonderful people on the media team. We need wonderful people reaching our youth and young adults. We need you, New Life. We don't wanna do this on our own. We need you so that when people walk into this church and see us loving each other and serving each other, man, it impacts their heart to say, surely God is in this place. I sense love in this atmosphere. I sense peace in this atmosphere. I sense something in this atmosphere that I don't sense anywhere else. That's the church that new life is to be. That's the church that we are. And if it's gonna continue to be that way, we need you to continue to come off the bench and join the teams. 
If you went through Grow Track and maybe you designated a team, but you haven't had an opportunity to join the team yet, can I encourage you? Reach back out and let's contribute together. And we'll end with this. We're committing, we're connecting, we're contributing. And Paul gives an encouragement in the chapter three of Colossians. And I think he gives the encouragement to continue to continue. He says the following, Colossians chapter three, verses 12 through 14, since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. I think Paul's giving a an encouragement to continue. In fact, if you actually read throughout Paul's letters, he talks a lot about this aspect of forgiving one another, being kind to one another. How many know that because we're family, just like your regular family, it means sometimes we're gonna get on each other's nerves. <laughs> it means sometimes we're gonna hurt each other. It means sometimes something may happen and you may get offended. And Paul recognized this. He recognized the hand of God on his church and he recognized the plot of the enemy to try to infiltrate from within. Because there's a, a quote that says, a house divided against itself can't stand. If I could affect you from the inside, then you won't be focused on what Jesus really wants you to do. So I wanna encourage you today, if you've ever had a hurt happen to you or maybe you're hurt now and it was a church prior to this, or maybe you got hurt here and maybe it was by church leadership or maybe it was by somebody here that goes to the church, it's time to deal with that. You were never meant to just carry that around. It's time to deal with it. And Paul is giving us instruction here to forgive and to put on tenderhearted mercy and kindness and love. And, and I wanna give you a few closing thoughts today about working through the hurt you have. You need to first acknowledge the hurt. This is something that I feel. This is something that happened. It's real. I'm not gonna shove it down. I'm gonna acknowledge the hurt and then take it a step and talk to the person that hurts you. Don't talk about the person that hurts you. Go to the person and talk to them about what happened. Reality is, they may not even know that they did that. They, never, they may not even know that they said something that offended you, and you're over here carrying this weight, stewing and, and angry about it, and they're not even thinking about you. Go to that person and talk to them, and how many know that sometimes, even as a result of talking, sometimes it doesn't go the way you wanted it to go? And then what do we do? We wanna plot some revenge in our heart. How am, I gonna how am I gonna get back to them? Maybe it's every time I see them, I'm gonna give them a cold shoulder. I'm gonna talk badly about them. Whatever it is, we wanna take revenge into our hands. Can I encourage you today? Let God deal with the people that hurt you. You just focus on forgiving and walking in forgiveness. Don't do anything else. Put it in his hands. Don't confuse God's people with God. In your heart, don't think, well, this is God's fault. I'm gonna get away from God because how could God allow this? How could God do this? Don't confuse God's people with God. God loves you, God cares about you. In fact, he wants to help you with your hurt. Don't push away from him, don't isolate. And then don't give up on all people because of some people. I want you to think about this. Whenever you've gotten a bad haircut or you've had a bad meal at a restaurant, majority of the time, it's never meant that you stop getting haircuts and you stop going to restaurants. You didn't just give up on that thing because of one bad experience. Don't give up on all people because of some people. And just like you're in a process, so are other people. Sometimes we don't know what people are going through. We don't know what they're facing. Don't give up. Jesus did not give up on you. In our lowest moments, and how many of you know, we ain't perfect yet. We're not completely, you know, what we need to be yet. We'll be that in heaven. But even in our mistakes, our flaws, our failures, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father praying on your behalf. So if he won't give up on you, don't give up on people. Don't give up on the church of Jesus Christ. He wants you to walk with the people around you. God loves so greatly. God loves you. God loves his church and he wants you to love this church family. He wants you to love other believers, and how do we do that? We're gonna commit to being here. We're gonna connect while we're here. We're gonna make sure that we contribute. We're gonna join a team, and then of course, we're gonna make sure we continue, even in the midst of our hurts and our pains. Would you bow your heads today as we have a time to close? If you're here today, and you've not yet made that first decision to commit to Jesus as Lord and Savior, 
this is your moment to do that. And I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand, but if you are here and you don't know where you'd go if you died today, either heaven or hell, you've not given your life to him, you've not had your sins forgiven, and now you're not living for him yet, you can make that decision today. And it's as simple as a prayer like this. Dear Jesus, I realize today that I need you. I confess my sins. I confess my wrongdoings. I confess that I've tried to live my life my own way, but I need Jesus. Please forgive me, make me clean, and help me to live for you. In your name I pray, amen. It's as simple as that. But then as we close today, if you're here, where are you as far as what step you need to take? Maybe you haven't committed here to being faithfully here at church. Maybe you haven't connected with other people yet. Maybe you haven't joined a team and you're not contributing yet. Or maybe you need to forgive somebody. You need to continue. You need to talk to them. You need to let go of that hurt. What do you need to take? What step do you need to take? And as you stand to your feet, we're gonna have a time of prayer just to close. And I wanna invite you to stand right now. And as we're standing in a moment of reverence, would you close your eyes? What is God saying to you? What step is God asking you to take? What is he speaking to your heart right now? Nobody looking around, this is a moment between you and God. God, what are you asking of me? What are you asking of me? I choose to obey. I recognize my need to take that step. I recognize that need to take that step. As we consider that step, let us consider the goodness of God in our lives. Father, we love you today, and we thank you for your word. We thank you that you've used your word to speak to us. And God, now we don't want just to be hearers of your word. We want to be doers of your word. So we surrender ourselves to you, Father. What do you want to do in us? And now what do you want to do through us? What step would you have us take? Holy Spirit, our hearts are sensitive to you and we surrender to you today. God, come and do your work in us and continue to do your work right here at New Life, that we would continue to be a church, that it's an environment of us loving one another and that as people come into this environment, they would sense the very presence and love of Jesus Christ and that it would continue to transform hearts and lives. Father, we love you and we honor you today and we devote ourselves to whatever step you want us to take. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray and all God's people said, amen and amen. Can we celebrate Jesus today? He is so good and he is so great. New Life, we love you. God bless you as you go today. I pray that you'll connect with somebody on your way out. And we can't wait to see you for Easter Sunday. Stop by our Life Center for a bake sale. God bless you today in Jesus' name. for joining us for today's message at New Life. We pray that you encounter Jesus right where you are and that his presence touched your heart. If you're here today and you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we'd love to support you on your new journey. So scan the QR code on the screen to get resources, information about your next steps. We would love to send you helpful materials and guide you as you grow in your faith. If you haven't already, we encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, download our app by searching New Life Lehigh, and follow us on social media. This is how you can stay up to date with everything happening here, including upcoming events, messages, and online communities. We hope to see each of you next week, either back online or here in person at one of our services. Remember, don't do life alone.